this spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm David Rose. You have a right to feel safe in your own home, to know that if you are the victim of a crime, you'll get a prompt response from police and their best efforts to get justice for you. But in reality right now, do any of us feel safe the way things are going in our state? More and more, we're hearing stories of people taking the law into their own hands. And though that can go wrong quickly, can you really blame them? So tonight, we're putting a spotlight on the rise in vigilante justice. The issue is not always cut and dry. Even if you believe you acted in self-defense, the law can take its sweet time to clear you. Last December, two men kicked in the back door of a home in Spanaway when Jeremy Smith and his sister were inside. He says he warned them to get down, but opened fire when one of the guys reached for something, killing him. Protect yourself. You know, that doesn't mean go looking for it. That means just be ready. My life is more important to me than theirs is. And me going home to my family, my kids is more important to me than theirs is. I don't know what they wanted out of this house. I don't know what they were doing, but I don't care. Kind of goes back to your rights. I have the right to carry and I have the right to protect myself and I have the right to protect my property. Even though that shooting was almost 10 months ago, the Pierce County Prosecutor's Office says their violent crimes unit has still not made any decision yet on whether Smith will face charges. Crime is up this year and the number of police officers is way down. And when there's that kind of imbalance, it can drive victims to take extreme measures. Just this week, a woman in Puyallup emailed me. She was very upset after a thief stole her car, the one she needs to take her kids to school and to go to work. She said they did everything good citizens are told to do. She and her husband immediately filed a police report. But 12 hours later, everything went sideways as they were forced to take the law into their own hands. They burnt my back seat belt. They just burnt it. They were bored. Michael Wilson is frustrated for several reasons. His wife's car now has deep scratches carved into the paint. It was trashed by thieves when it was stolen right out of their driveway in Puyallup on October 13th. Obviously, they were doing drugs. They tore my back seat. But that's not the only reason they reached out to me for help. It's what happened after they spotted their car in a parking lot at 176th and Meridian later that night that concerns them. I saw two people who were in the car um, in the process of getting high. His wife called 911. And the police said that an officer is on their way. Michael says he didn't know if the suspects were armed, but he wasn't taking any chances. He grabbed his gun. I immediately used my Second Amendment rights to have them leave my vehicle. It worked. The suspects both took off. We waited for an hour to see if the cops would come. During that hour waiting, the cops never showed up. Uh, one of the people that was in my car came back. I used my Second Amendment rights again to stop them from trying to get into their vehicle, not knowing what was in their vehicle, if they were going to try to hurt me or my family because I had my kids with me. Um, so not knowing if they were going to, I used my Second Amendment rights. My wife was on the phone with the police again why they were, why they were there on the phone telling them what I was doing. The assailant also called the cops telling them that I had them using my Second Amendment right, and they never showed up. After waiting three hours, his wife drove her car home, stinking of fentanyl and meth. A deputy showed up at 6.15 the next morning. When the cops came, they didn't take any fingerprints because they said my wife had drove the car home. And at that point, it was null and void for them to find anything. Michael says something needs to change. He knows it was dangerous to confront the suspects, but that car means everything to his wife. She feels violated. She doesn't feel like it's hers anymore. There's no need to have this car is how she feels. And she, not saying that, that she doesn't want the car, but she just feels like the car is not hers. It's so dirty. It's not, even if they cleaned it, you don't feel like it's yours anymore. Because of staffing issues, the Pierce County Sheriff's Department says there were only two deputies working graveyard shift in that district when Michael called for help. On their way to respond, they had a DUI driver in front of them they had to stop. Then they were dispatched to a welfare check and then another DUI driver that led them on a short pursuit. In all, they had 12 back-to-back -back calls and say they don't know why South Sound 911 dispatch didn't prioritize his call. Officers going call to call, working too much by themselves is exactly, exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing. It's the opposite of community policing. It's the opposite of outreach and building trust in the community. It's just tired cops doing their best and getting more and more exhausted. Steve Strand is the executive director of the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, known as WASPIC. 
He says our state has the lowest number of officers per capita in the nation. We net lost almost 500 officers in 2021. That is disastrous. Strand says one of the biggest problems in retention is because of changes to the laws in 2021 that restrict police pursuits and decriminalize drug possession. Officers don't feel they can get justice for victims. Open the door. Nope, he's putting in gear. He's going. Don't do it. Don't do it. Strand was one of the law enforcement and political leaders from both sides of the aisle who participated in a video in Snohomish County calling for lawmakers to roll back some of the changes they say have emboldened criminals. I think we need to tell the legislature loud and clear, even if this isn't what you meant, this is not okay. He says WASPIC is focused on getting state aid for local governments to increase police staffing fixing the pursuit law and making felony drug possession illegal again. We need to fix that, not because we want to criminalize addiction, but we need to leverage people, incentivize them off the street and keep them safe and get to get healthy off the street. Letting people die in addiction on the street is not compassionate. That includes pushing for money to build the infrastructure for treatment. That's heavy lifting. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of staff, and it's gonna take years to build that infrastructure. We have to do both of those things at the same time. He's hopeful. I think the stars are beginning to align where we can start to come together and find ways to move forward and, and build good, strong public safety in this state. Until then, Strand worries there will be more victims like Michael and his wife who put themselves in danger because they are frustrated, unwilling to sit back and just wait for police to arrive and ready to take the law into their own hands. I had the people in my car. Um, we called them. If they were there in five minutes, they probably would have found them. They said that they would send us a link for us to take pictures of damage of the vehicle, and they never have sent us the link. They have never responded, never asked us any questions of how our car was. They, didn't, they don't even want pictures. They have only have their drug evidence, and that's all they've asked for. They haven't asked us for, to send them pictures of the vehicle and what damage was done. So what can you do? Steve Strand says, work with your elected city leaders, your county council, your mayor, your county executive, or your sheriff, and push for the resources needed to bring up policing levels in our state. The South Sound has seen vehicle thefts double this year from 2021, so it's no surprise we found another auto-centric story of vigilante justice in Pierce County. But while this case of DIY detective work has a happy ending, we're putting it in the spotlight because police say this really is a cautionary tale. So much could have gone wrong. Oh. A scene Hannah O'Dell says has happened several times. Somebody broke into my car. And she says she's had enough. Living on Hosmer will make you snap out of your sheltered life. So when she told us someone stole her ex-boyfriend's Mazda protege. I decided to get off my butt and go look for my own car. Odell believes cops are too busy to find her car and couldn't wait. So she took matters into her own hands. I have a brand new baby. So with my ex not having a car, I have to do all of the driving. That's I can't do that. I have to work. There's a lot on South Tacoma Way, Odell says, is well known for having stolen cars. I was seriously excited because it was the first place we looked. Odell posted about her success on Facebook, gaining a lot of attention from others in the community. I said it's time that us as a community come together and we get off our butts and we go do it ourselves. It actually got so much attention, she took it down. While Odell's story is a success, not all situations like this turn out peacefully. The other person could be armed and you don't know what that person is willing to do to you. And even if they're not, there are a number of ways the search can go wrong. Mistaken identities, plates get switched, and now you beat up that person who is innocent of any crimes, you're gonna end up behind bars with even bigger trouble than the person who stole your vehicle. In the case your car is stolen and there are people around it, Sergeant Moss says to call 911 if you recover your vehicle without any issue. You're still gonna need to call it in so that we can come in and take it out of the stolen vehicle system. At the end of the day, we're talking about property and we're, we're valuing your life over your vehicle. For the Spotlight, I'm Nia Wong. Now, the other risk Hannah was running is getting herself arrested. There is no RCW that spells out how to make a legal citizen's arrest in Washington State or what the rules are for taking back allegedly stolen property. In fact, if police are called out to a citizen's arrest, standard procedure is for them to detain both parties first and then figure out who's right 
and who's wrong. Up next, we're going to introduce you to a real life folk hero. He's a soldier who made a stand to protect his neighborhood and then asked his army buddies to join him. We defended ourselves from a heinous crime and uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, the way it went down. The year is 1989 in Tacoma. A group of soldiers from JBLM and their neighbors were throwing a block party barbecue. Everyone was having a good time when suddenly gunfire erupted from alleged gang members. Bullets are flying and the soldiers decided to shoot back. The spotlights AJ Janivelle sat down with the army vet whose home became a battleground 30 years ago to talk about the lack of law enforcement back then and whether history is repeating itself now. Of course, the front door was right here and there was a In 1987, here, Bill and, Folk uh, made the decision to lay down roots in the city of Tacoma. When I bought this house, it was condemned. And no windows, no doors, no wiring, no plumbing, nothing. And so I, I wanted a fixer-upper. Folk, an army ranger sergeant at the time, wanted a house he felt invested in. He wanted a community he felt connected to. And that is what he said he found here on South Ash Street. It was a great place, super quiet. But that all changed around 1989. The neighborhood just kept getting progressively worse. And for me, deploy, come back, and then see how much worse it had gotten in that short period of time and how they were harassing the neighbors. I mean, these guys were like trying to take over the neighborhood. Folk says drugs and gangs infested his street and nothing was being done to stop it. Unfortunately, there was little the police could do. I mean, we'd have like, I can remember in July, we had gang-related shooting, Crips and Blood, a shooting on the street out here. And typically you'd call the police and, and 911 and no one would ever show up. So instead, Folk tells me he and his community took action. They started taking pictures of criminal activity, writing down license plate numbers, and trying to make a difference. In September, Folk organized a cookout at his house to get more attention on the problem. September 23rd, we start like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. All the, you know, the... The good neighborhood families came, they brought their kids, were cooking burgers. He says the peace did not last long. And then we started getting harassed by those guys across the street. Folk tells me he and a few of his army ranger friends walked across the street and confronted the group, telling them to leave his neighbors alone. Instead of backing down, he says the group threatened to come back and burn his house down. 6.30, a car rolls down the street and a guy just fires a round off straight in the air. Like, like that's the warning shot. Folk says with a house full of guests, including families, he realized trouble might be coming. So he called the base. Hey, this is Sergeant Folk. I'm at home, I'm about to come under attack and I need every available ranger at my house now. He tells me about 15 army rangers showed up at his house, joining the ranks with a bunch of his civilian neighbors and they prepared for an attack, which came fast. It was like being on a military firing range when somebody sends commence fire. And just all of a sudden, it was just pow, 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 gunfire from every direction. And, uh, you know, you could hear bullets hitting the house. In total, at least 300 rounds were fired. Folk says the majority coming from the alleged gang members. According to reports from 30 years ago, no one was injured in the shooting. But Folk says several attackers were hit. If a gang member got shot, they didn't, they didn't like lay around and wait for EMS. Their, their gang bodies picked them up, carried them away, took them wherever, whatever they did with them. Eventually, police arrived. The scene was cleared. According to reports, two alleged gang members were arrested, but no charges were filed against Folk or any of his friends. We were told by the police and others that, you know, we were legally right and we, we, we did. We defended ourselves from a heinous crime and uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, the way it went down. So, and, then, and it's not like they didn't have a whole load of witnesses to say, this is exactly how it happened. You know, because there's like 30 people here to tell the same story. 30 years later, Folk still calls this street home. A scar from the battle. You don't want to erase all of the history. Intentionally remains in the wall of his house as a reminder of that day. It was a wake up call, you know, for, for politicians and for the administration within the police department. Change eventually came to Tacoma and the violence subsided. However, in the last few years, deadly crime is returning. Tacoma is seeing more than a 200% increase in homicides this year in comparison to 2017. It's out of control. And I think that, you know, I think that the political environment is exactly the same as it is back, you know, in the late 80s, where, you know, they don't want to deal with the problem. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't even want to admit that there is a problem. And they're just thinking like, hoping it's going to go away. And it's not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. 
So what's new from 30 years ago? The police chief in Tacoma has embarked on a data-driven approach to policing crime hotspots. The initial batch of results will be presented to the city council on November 1st. When we come back, on the road to revenge. It's not justice when anger is in the driver's seat. What separates a righteous quest for justice from a criminal thirst for revenge can be a razor thin line. In both cases, what drives us is the feeling that we've been wronged. Rage has been all too common on our roads this year, and there's a body count to show for it. The latest victim, a 24 year old woman who may have died because someone flashed their high beams. She had her struggles, but she always fought to get through those. And and I'm proud of her. Scott Davis struggles to keep it together, talking about his only child losing her life just as she began to land on her own feet. He says his daughter, Raylin, was never afraid to show you how she felt. How full of love she was. She was spontaneous and bright and caring and helpful. She was always willing to give. The Washington State Patrol says Raylin was a passenger inside a 2014 Kia Sorento, traveling back to Puget Sound from Leavenworth. But somewhere near Skykomish, the driver of the Kia got into some sort of altercation when people inside what's described as a dark colored Subaru SUV that also has a roof mounted cargo basket. Troopers say whatever sparked the conflict escalated when a passenger inside the Subaru pulled a gun and shot through the Kia's rear window. The bullet struck Raylin. She died along US Highway 2. This one started out with high beams being flashed, so I'm not sure what the suspect vehicle was upset about, but the victim vehicle was just driving home from going to Oktoberfest. No chance to say goodbye. No chance to say I love you. Raylan's father, Scott, filled with emotions, is difficult. But he believes the person who killed Raylan can redeem themselves if only they step forward and take responsibility for what they did. Reach inside of you and do what's right and do what's right for, for me and for Raylin and for her family and do what's right for the public. That was the spotlight Steve Kiggins reporting. The Washington State Patrol tells us there have been more than 40 shootings on highways so far this year just in King County. Now, not all of those were road rage related, but in a new study by Forbes, Washington ranks ninth in the nation for aggressive driving. And overall, 85% of U.S. drivers surveyed said they've experienced some form of road rage. When the spotlight returns, the weapon more and more homeowners are buying when they want to catch criminals themselves. This next story in the spotlight shows you you don't necessarily need a weapon to get justice. In this case, the only shooting done was by a camera. But police say the doorbell video painted a clear target on this suspect's back because the burglar will be very easy for homeowners to recognize if he tries another break-in. Once again, here's the spotlights, AJ Janivel. Chelsea Village in Arlington, peaceful and quiet, but that feeling of comfort was ripped from a family. I spoke to Jackie and her mom. They didn't want to show their faces. I would never wish this upon anybody. I feel so violated. Calling my name mom, that mom that makes the hair stand up on your skin. He was within two to three inches. I mean, he was pretty much standing over the top of me. He got very close. He lifted the blankets up on me. According to Jackie's cameras, this man was in her home for about seven to eight minutes. She tells me it's terrifying to think about what he could have been doing in that time. He could have been staring at me. He could have shot me with my own gun. He could have killed my whole family. Jackie tells me the thief got away with about $2,000 worth of her stuff including a gun. But Jackie says the feeling of safety is the worst thing he stole. And telling the boys, my sons, that, you know, no, he hasn't been caught yet, they're worried. They're very worried too. And I'm, I'm supposed to be mama bear protecting my cubs and I almost feel a little bit of a failure. Her surveillance camera got a great shot of the suspect who has a very unique face tattoo. Police say thanks to these images, they identified the man as 32 year old Luke James. A known thief, one Fox 13 News has reported on in the past. James also posted on Facebook back in 2020. He doesn't regret the permanent facial art. He's got that hideous tattoo on his face. I mean, it's just very obvious it's him. 
Jackie said she posted her footage and her story to Facebook, and the tips are pouring in. There's lots of people out looking for him, and I will find him. If he keeps up his criminal ways, Luke James may choose the wrong house to burglarize, one where the homeowner is ready to use deadly force to defend his family. Arlington police say they believe James is getting help to hide, and they warn those people to stop or they'll be facing arrest as well for rendering criminal assistance. James frequents the Smoky Point area of Snohomish County. He is considered armed and dangerous. If you spot him, call 911. You can also submit an anonymous tip to Crime Stoppers for a cash reward of up to $1,000. Check for doorbell footage is the new dust for fingerprints of modern day crime fighting. Demand for video doorbell systems roared back to life post pandemic with almost 12 million units sold worldwide in 2021, a 63% increase. Close to 20% of U.S. households now have a Ring, Nest or other smart device installed. But how many of those have been installed properly? Well, there is a right and a wrong way to set up your system. Here are some of the tips the companies give out to get you started. Adjust your camera's point of view so people walk by your device rather than walk right towards it. Make sure your cameras are at the right height. About nine feet off the ground outside is a good rule of thumb. Be sure there's enough lighting. Night vision doesn't mean the ability to record in absolute darkness. And don't expect your camera to cover too much. If you want your front porch, driveway, and curbside mailbox all monitored, you probably need more than one camera. Well, that's all the time we have on this edition of The Spotlight. Until next time, be smart and stay safe.